Great. Well, let's start this evening uh, update with a prayer. And um, I promise you this is going to be a very interesting one. So, Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that we, your children, uh, together with your Holy Spirit, can look into your word and understand uh, that you are speaking to us through it even today. We thank you, Father, that more than uh, 2,800 years ago, you chose holy men of God who did not write anything from their own private interpretation, but as they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they delivered the message for all of us even today. Father, we thank you for your heart that you want your children not to be in the dark. We once were darkness, we're no longer. Now we're light, and we're the children of light. We are to walk in the light, and part of it is to understand your word and to walk in it. So we thank you and we bless you this evening from your holy city, from the only place on planet Earth you said, this is my place. Um, this is where I'm going to put my name from the city of Jerusalem, I pray, and all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. So, good evening everyone. <clears throat> this is again Amir Tsalfati, and I'm here in Jerusalem. This is Monday, March 19, 2018, and we are going to talk a little bit about several things that happen um, that I believe are of a great interest for the people of God. Um, we're going to start, of course, with yesterday's uh, very uh, predicted victory of Vladimir Putin. Uh, I will also want to talk about um, what is going on with Iran, with the Iran deal, and one of why is it that uh, the Secretary of State uh, was basically um, moved aside uh, for the the head of the FBI. Uh, we're going to talk about what Turkey is doing right now in northern Syria and about the very interesting visit of Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia that starts an eight days uh, visit in the United States and he has some very interesting things uh, to say and even to deliver. So we're going to start uh, in a few seconds, but I just want to tell you that I just came back um, this evening. In fact, I landed, uh, believe it or not, two hours ago. I landed in Tel Aviv after uh, spending uh, the long weekend in Switzerland. I was so blessed to have a uh, couple meetings there, and in both of them people came, people drove all the way from Austria, and from Germany all the way into Switzerland. Of course, the Swiss people themselves also came from different parts of Switzerland. It was a wonderful gathering of saints, and uh, all of them you could see that they were hungry and thirsty to, uh, to, to hear the word, um, and they were also very much encouraged um, to understand that God is pleased with that remnant that is there in Europe. Um, Europe is a dark, dark, dark place. All the people that are there could agree on that one. Europe is almost a godless place. Um, they kicked God out long ago, but the remnant there is so precious to God. And just as, you know, sometimes uh, we read in the Bible that Elijah felt that he's the only one, and God said to him, no, there are some that did not bow down to the Baal. I believe that um, God is trying to tell so many other countries around the world where <clears throat> the believers are a very small minority. I believe God is telling you, there are some more people like you, and be encouraged, you're not alone. I'm with you. And in fact, when you see people believing in such uh, strength in places so dark, you know that, that this, is, this is a true faith. This is uh, amazing to see that. And I, I was greatly encouraged and I hope that I was able also to encourage them uh, uh, about all of these things. Uh, my next trip to Europe will be actually to Vienna in Austria and later on to, um, to Romania. Uh, that will be in June. I can't wait to share with 
my, uh, the Austrians and the Romanians uh, brothers and sisters and to encourage them to keep uh, the good fight, to fight the good fight and to run the race and to finish well. Um, <clears throat> I also want to tell you that we are overwhelmed with the response to um, the sign-ups for all of our Israel tours. Um, we're going to um, release the dates for 2019 in just about a few days, and um, I encourage you to sign up as soon as you can because they're filling up very quickly. We still have only very few seats for the Young Adults Tour and the Alumni Tour, the Israel Jordan Tour that we're going to do this year. So if you're interested, this is your week probably to do so. Um, let's start by talking about Russia because I believe personally, and I've, I, I've said that many times and I even wrote uh, commentaries on Facebook, um, that I believe that we witnessed yesterday the re-election um, of um, a person who I believe will be possessing um, a demon called Gog. I believe that Vladimir Putin is the, you know, I, I don't know who the Antichrist is going to be, and quite frankly, I, I'm not interested in even in knowing that. I know that uh, it's very trendy now to start naming those people. But I can tell you that I feel in, in my spirit that at least for us, the believers that are not going to be here when the Antichrist will do all of these shenanigans, at least for us, I can tell you, I believe that we are right now witnessing the uh, Prince of Magog, Gog. Um, and I believe that um, Vladimir Putin, as a person, is having or will have in him that demon called Gog. Because Gog is a person, it's not a country. And I, I, I I mean, I really want you to understand that uh, the whole idea of, of, of Gog goes back to, uh, I mean, of Magog goes back to, of course, um, Genesis chapter 10, when he talks about the descendants of Noah and the sons of Noah that repopulated the earth after the flood. And there's no doubt about it. We're talking about the countries of the north. Even Ezekiel himself said that it will come from the north, the lands of the north. I do believe with all of my heart that Vladimir Putin is not only going to be the leader that will, that will have in him the spirit of God, but I believe that what we watched yesterday um, is something very, very interesting. And I'll tell you why. Um, first of all, I want you to know regarding Vladimir Putin that um, this was the first time that not only that his victory was important to him, but also um, as far as the turnout was important to him. The turnout was super important to him. He called people, and it was freezing cold. As far as the Celsius, it was minus 12, minus 15. He, he, he kept telling people they must go out to vote, they must go out to vote. And, and by the way, when he appeared to, to be... Um, Shortly after the polling centers closed on Sunday night, uh, Putin appeared to be uh, on target to achieve the desired 65% turnout. Uh, so it worked. But I also um, I also want you to know that um, this this is a different thing. Uh, this, this is a completely different th uh, thing than than we've ever seen before. Let me tell you. First of all, Russia, uh, Vladimir Putin, is the longest-serving ruler since Joseph Stalin, um, and, and it's it's amazing thing. Uh, his victory, which he claimed 73.9% uh, of vote according to the state-run exit polls, was um, a conclusion that the Kremlin was reportedly anxious about the turnout. And as I said, the turnout eventually was 65 percent. Um, but this is a different dif di different story. Even more important for Putin is not the turnout, but that this election marked the culmination of his nearly two decade long project to control information in Russia 
and manipulate the Russian society. And, and now Putin has proved, proven beyond any doubt that the Russia that he has built in is, uh, uh, is his and his alone. He's the sole ruler. Um, this whole thing, be, uh, he began his long-running disinformation campaign when he came to power in 2000, and he started taking over Russia's independent television channels in, in, in literally beginning the oli he, he, he was bringing the oligarchs who owned them to heal or ousting them from the country. And since then, he has chipped away at free expression, um, political dissent, and independ uh, independent voices, one paper, one website, and one blogger at a time. Each new amendment to uh, uh, the law declaring NGOs as foreign agents of undesirable, in each assassination of a journalist or political leader who went too far, in each expansion of what constitutes uh, extremist content online, content online brought Putin one step closer to his day. And and this is it, guys. We are watching someone who is controlling Russia in ways that no one before did so since Joseph Stalin. But more so, I will tell you, that um, he, he even started in 2016 the Internet Research Agency, um, where he basically um, realized that that's the best way to manipulate the ideas of the Russian people. Um, and so um, we're, we're talking about something, something big, um, and we know that some some people in that agency even wrote on the popular messaging app Telegram. They showed actually that they were dictated what to say and what to publish and how to do things way before things even happened. Everything is well planned and well organized. Vladimir Putin, I believe, is entering into maybe his last term, six years presidency, but you have to understand something. After that one, he cannot run again, at least for four more or six more years. And so for him, in a way, because according to the Russian constitution, a president cannot serve more than two terms uh, in a row. So we're going to have him for the next six years. If, and if I may say, the biggest problem that he has right now, after he tried to, to show the whole world that you know, he's not really doing much, to the, uh, to the Syrians and everything is under control. Right now he has to stabilize his economy and his economy is in shambles. And for that he needs gas and oil. He needs to control the prices of the gas and the oil and he needs to control the reservoirs of the gas and the oil and he needs to control the way to channel them to the rest of the world. And the biggest bone in the throat of Vladimir Putin right now in his effort to do so is Israel. Israel not only found amazing reservoirs of natural gas, but Israel is signing deals one after the other with countries such as Egypt, but such as Europe, countries in Europe to not only supply gas, but also build underwater pipes to bring the gas all the way over there. So, so this is something he cannot afford losing. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you what we're watching right now beyond the massive Russian presence already in the Middle East and beyond the culmination or the entrenchment of the Russians in Syria on the coast of the Mediterranean on the border with Israel, we're also now going to watch a different Putin, a Putin that is not running for elections anymore, a Putin that is not going to try and please anyone anymore. Right now, he wants a legacy of someone who brought Russia also to greatness in its economy. And um, <clears throat> I believe that we are going to, we're in, in an amazing time to see that. And so this is as far as Russia is is uh, is control I believe that we watched yesterday the re-election of a Russian president but he entered in my mind in my eyes in my heart and in my spirit 
he entered into his term for the first time as Gog. Um, you must understand, even the Antichrist himself will be a, a regular, normal person, and Satan himself will, will infiltrate into him and dwell in him. And, and because the spirit of the Antichrist is a spirit, is a demonic thing, and it will dwell in, in, inside someone, a world leader, a, pol a politician, or someone of that, of that uh, sense. So my point is, I believe we're watching a regular world leader such as Vladimir Putin, but I believe the spirit of Gog that that what we what I what I call um, the um, spiritual entity the demon of Gog just as we had in, the Bible talks about the Prince of Tyre and the Prince of Sidon in 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 the Old Testament this is going to be the Prince of Magog and I believe with all of my heart that the door for Ezekiel 38 and 39 to be to be fulfilled is for the first time wide open only when the leader is aware of the fact that he has the calling the demonic calling the satanic calling to do that uh, that job I, I, I truly I don't believe that Vladimir Putin just as a person you know, is interested in destroying Israel. I don't believe so. I believe that in his right mind, he understands the importance of Israel. And that's why he's good friends with Netanyahu. But I believe that right now, coming all, already into the last term of his presidency, uh, I believe that this is the point where all the conditions in the ground are ready for him to assume upon himself the role that he, 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 he always wanted, I guess, and for that, a demonic, I believe, a demonic um, um, entity, a demon, will, will eventually get into him. Because the hatred towards Israel and the longing to destroy Israel is demonic. There is absolutely no logical explanation to that. I mean, a country that loves peace, a country that actually saves so many other countries from terror attacks by giving them information and throating, thwarting other terrorist attacks. A country that shares with the world unbelievable wealth of information, of technology. Why would anyone want to destroy it? It is demonic. It is demonic and satanic and the moment that demon will dwell in him, he will not anymore look at Israel as an asset, as an ally, as a friend, but as a super enemy. And I believe that once he looks into his economic situation right now, and when he understands that all the wells, the wealth of Syria, as far as oil, is in the side, on the eastern side, it is controlled by the, Kur by the uh, Kurds and s supervised or protected by the Americans, he already understood he cannot take it. All that is left for him is to try to get the gas from the Mediterranean, which is right now uh, owned by Israel. And I, I, I'm telling you guys, I've never felt that before, that a, a person that we read about in the scriptures regarding end time prophecies is not only alive, but I, we know who he is. This is, that's, that's what I have in my spirit, and that's what I, I see happening. And it's interesting because um, that, that will, of course, seal the deal when it comes to his alliance with the others. Who are the other countries that are right now doing whatever they want and the world is not really giving any regards to? It's Iran and Turkey, which moves me now to the shenanigans of the Turkish Sultan. Interesting how every leader in our area wants to now assume upon himself some ancient titles such as Tsar for Putin and Sultan for, for Erdogan, but Erdogan just completed a, uh, a military operation of not only um, surrounding the enclave of Efrain, not far from the border of Syria with, uh, uh, with Turkey, but he took over the city and he basically um, kicked all the Kurds out. And this is what he always wanted. Uh, you know, for the longest time I've been telling you guys that Turkey is not interested in, in anything in, in Syria besides kicking the Kurds out. 
and and of course in its biggest or bigger picture Turkey would love to become the leader of the Sunni world and there's nothing better than doing that with coming against Israel but what he does right now he's doing anything he wants and nobody stops him nobody stops him he's a big headache right now for for the whole world um, can you imagine can you imagine Israel invading into Syria right now and just taking over a big city and kicking out all of its citizens what would the world say but that's exactly what Erdogan is doing right now and nobody is saying anything um, another very interesting thing is happening right now as the uh, crown prince of uh, Saudi Arabia is uh, about to begin a very interesting eight days uh, official visit to the United States. Let me tell you something, uh, not only that Israel had talks with him personally um, not long ago in Egypt, uh, but um, the voices that we keep hearing coming from Saudi Arabia are quite fascinating. Um, it starts with the fact that uh, bin Salman is basically saying that uh, a new wind is, is, is blowing right now from Saudi Arabia. He, he believes that women and men are equal as far as the rights and uh, you know he's making some great reforms over there right now with women uh, but he also is blaming Iran for all the problems in the Middle East um, I just heard a, a speech of Donald Trump President Trump uh, a few days ago in which he basically says look we can work on a deal with North Korea we can we can uh, work on many other things with other countries but let's face it, the problems everywhere are actually caused by Iran. Iran is the biggest problem. Iran is the one that is destabilizing the entire Middle East right now. And you can see that the Israeli Prime Minister, the American President, and the Saudi Crown Prince are talking in the exact same language. It's unheard of. Uh, you know, we've been we've been used to uh, an American president that is criticizing us and we've been used to a Saudi regime that hates our guts and, and sponsors terrorist organizations um, all, uh, you know, all over the Middle East and, and sponsors anti-Israeli activity all around the world. And for the first time we see that the Saudis are actually completely moving to the other side. Now, not that I'm a great, you know, supporter of the Saudis and what they stand for but biblically we see that Sheba and Didan are not coming against Israel in fact they're criticizing the attack on Israel and we're watching not only the rise of Gog from the north but we're also watching how the Saudis are flipping to the other side and and we're watching how the alliance that is being um, created right now is Forming and getting firmer and firmer and stronger and stronger. Um, it, this is just fascinating in my eyes. I, I just want you want you to understand. It's we live. I don't believe it's these are the last days. I believe this is the last hour. I've been. I'm trying to get the attention of so many people all over the world as I travel and as I'm reporting online. Guys, we're watching unbelievable uh, things happening. Um, one of the things that happened over the last few days is, of course, that the um, um, the administ I mean, Tr President Trump removed Rex Tillerson from being Secretary of State. And by the way, the first ones to bless that move, believe it or not, were the Saudis. Um, and, and one has to wonder how come the Saudis are, were so much against someone who was the um, president or CEO of Exxon or of an oil company, you would think that there must be great bodies, but apparently it, it, it was um, known uh, all across the uh, administration that Tillerson is actually uh, not in favor of more sanctions on Iran and certainly not in favor of pulling out of the deal with Iran. The Saudis are, are if there is one thing that the Saudis right now are so, are putting all of their effort right now is stopping Iran and, and they don't mind that people will think that they are on the side of Israel they don't mind that people will think that they are friends with with non-kosher people they do whatever they can to minimize the Iranian expansion 
and to disable the Iranian entrenchment in different parts of the world. You have to understand, you may not know that, but almost every other week, Saudi Arabia is being attacked with rockets. Now, you, you're saying, wait a minute, nobody told me that. Well, I'm telling you, the Houthi rebels in Yemen are getting rockets and money from Iran directly. We, we, we found, uh, you know, the manufacturer's name on those rockets. And these Iranian rockets that are being um, uh, supplied to uh, the Yemenites are being used against Riyadh and against Russia, uh, um, <clears throat> Saudi soldiers all over. And believe it or not, um, the capital of Saudi Arabia was under missiles attacks more than three or four times over the last few months. So you're, you're saying, how come the, the Saudis are so concerned with Iran? Iran is indirectly already attacking Saudi Arabia. And uh, it's very interesting. On the plane over here, I was reading an article in The Economist. Not that I'm a great uh, f fan of, of, of that very biased um, <clears throat> um, magazine, but, but there was some interesting uh, analysis there on, on what's going on in the Middle East. And I want to tell you something. There was a great article about how Saudi Arabia is getting closer to Iraq. You have to understand that there is Saudi here, then Iran is here, and Iraq is right in between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And any effort of the Iranian to take over Iraq will, will bring Iran closer and closer to Saudi Arabia. And there is a very small little strip of land on the coast of the Gulf, of, of, of the Persian Gulf, uh, that is in, the, in southern Iraq, which with the city of Basra. And right now, the Iraqis are, are being, uh, uh, being courted, in a way, both by Iran and by Saudi Arabia. Who would imagine, who would imagine Iraq, of all places, is going to enjoy uh, such a, um, generous offers. And in, 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 believe it or not, in Basra, on that coast, there's some five stars hotels right now. There's some events that are being organized right now. Some Saudi poets were just invited to a weekend over there. And, and they're trying, even the king of Saudi Arabia offered Iraq to offer to build them the largest soccer stadium in the world with over um, 150,000 seats. Can you imagine? And all of that is to win the Iraqi hearts and to win the Iraqi supports so they will not fall into the hands of Iran. The Iranians on the other side are actually trying to get the Iraqis to come to shop in their towns, and they even lifted the uh, the um, <clears throat> requirement for visas for Iraqis. So Iraqis can cross the border into Iran without any visa anymore, and they can shop. Uh, you know, the Iranian economy is really bad, and 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 they can shop, uh, do their shopping spree over there in, in towns in in southern Iran that. Can you imagine? I mean, we're watching some amazing things that are happening over there right now. <clears throat> I also want you to know that uh, Iran is not only um, uh, having a threat that by middle, the middle of the month of May, um, President Donald Trump um, is considering pulling out of the Iran deal. And, and, and you have to understand the consequences of such a thing is that if any other country will continue dealing with Iran, they will not be able to continue, continue doing business with America. And that's, of course, going to stop the flow of cash and capital into Iran with, from companies, first of all, American companies such as Boeing, um, but also other companies such as uh, car manufacturers from Europe and others. So we're, we're watching how Iran is literally about to lose its, its gain from the Iran deal and they will definitely run into the open arms of Russia for something more than just political asylum. And they will want a gain of, 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 of gas and oil as well. And um, 
we know that um, Iran is also um, continuing its effort to destabilize our side. They send um, money to Hamas organization in, in, uh, in Gaza. And believe it or not, you would think that after so many years that the Palestinians suffer in Gaza, you would think that finally they'll start taking care of themselves. But all those millions keep going towards tunnels. Israel just destroyed over this weekend two more tunnels. We have the latest technology in the world, something that we cannot even talk about right now. We detect tunnels that are, are being dug and, and, and we destroy them before they become a threat to us. And the Palestinians are so, 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 um, um, not only, uh, I, I guess they're frustrated because we're not killing their men or we're not really waging war. We're just destroying their infrastructures. And so they pour so much effort and time and money and something. And with two bombs from the Israeli aircraft, these things are gone. And they cannot understand how come we have the intelligence of knowing exactly. We're not only destroying tunnels that are coming from Gaza outside towards Israel. We're also destroying tunnels that are within Gaza uh, because they, they dig tunnels to basically, once Israel, if Israel will ever come in in a war, they would love to surprise us from those tunnels that connect their own places. And we also destroy those. And for that, you need very precise intelligence. And so Israel decided instead of um, punishing uh, Gaza, we just need to uh, destroy their tunnels, and, and that's it. So we have Iron Dome that, uh, that is a great answer to the rockets, and we have now the, the Iron Wall under the ground that is the answer for their tunnels, and, 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 and they understand that, and it's quite frustrating for them. Um, we just ca caught a two French um, workers, uh, actually a driver and, and a security person um, of the French consulate in Jerusalem um, that uh, were smuggling over 70 different types of weapons from Gaza to the West Bank. Uh, West Bank. They would go to Gaza to a French charity organization to the Palestinians. The people over there will will give them guns and under the uh, the immunity that they have as diplomats, they would go through the border with Israel without being searched. Um, so you, you can imagine that now we are not even going to believe diplomatic uh, uh, personnel anymore. We're not going to, to believe NGOs, non-government um, uh, organizations that are there for uh, you know, humanitarian reasons. Um, they are just, just like they used ambulances to smuggle terrorists, and of course that's a violation of any rule. Now they're using also humanitarian organizations to do that. Israel, with great intelligence, stopped and indicted uh, the two people, and uh, the French are very embarrassed. The French, apparently the Consul General of France, didn't know anything about it. He's as shocked as, as the rest of the government of France, and they uh, demand um, a very thorough um, <clears throat> investigation of this whole thing. So I, uh, I'm not going to get longer. Uh, I, just, I just wanted to express my uh, concern about what we have with the Russian elections. And, and of course, um, some people are asking me, Amir, when do you think the American um, attack, uh, American-Israeli attack, um, that I talked about earlier last week uh, will take place. Of course, uh, these are plans that we have um, in case things will deteriorate. Um, we believe that uh, there are certain things and certain steps that must be taken before things get worse. Um, uh, we, the Israeli Prime Minister and the, the American President talked about it. The Israeli military and the American military already exercised that. Uh, it, it's only a matter of when, not if, um, and um, it's not for me to decide. Uh, <laughs> I, I wish I knew, but uh, I don't think they, A, I don't think they want me to know, and, uh, and I don't think they want you to know. So if it happens, and when it happens, you'll know, but one thing is for sure, 
both Israel and the Americans um, are not happy with what we see that is happening beyond the border, the entrenchment of Iran, the dist the the, the continuing uh, continuing effort of uh, to destabilize the whole Middle East um, is on the way of uh, the Trump administration to produce and introduce the ultimate peace deal. I believe that uh, it's almost finalized. <clears throat> it's very interesting because the um, Israel suffered two terrorist attacks um, over the last week. Um, one is a Palestinian driver uh, rammed uh, a group of Israeli soldiers uh, and killed an officer and a soldier. Um, and uh, the second thing happened in the uh, old city of Jerusalem. Um, uh, a terrorist uh, ran towards um, a Jewish uh, person uh, who was wearing a yarmulke on his way back from the Wailing Wall and he stabbed him and killed him. And these things happened over the last 72 hours and uh, we heard nothing from the Palestinian president. Uh, no, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, there is no, not even one word that was said uh, against uh, such actions. And it's interesting because the American ambassador to Israel, David Friedman, uh, just released a statement in which he says that this is an outrageous thing not to hear a single word from the Palestinian Authority uh, um, regarding these um, um, these events. So what we got from Abu Mazen, from Mahmoud Abbas, just a few minutes ago is he called the American ambassador to Israel, uh, I, I don't think I can say that, son of a... a and, and that's, you know, S-O-B. And also, he said that he's a Zionist and a filthy settler. That's what he called him. This is, it, it summarizes what the Palestinian Authority thinks about America and Americans nowadays. They really want your money. They want your, but once you don't, you, once you don't uh, um, supply the political um, material that they want, uh, they'll, they'll just throw you away. That's exactly what happened with the Saudis. The Saudis, when the Saudis told the Palestinians something Palestinians didn't like, suddenly the Palestinians said, we are not interested in Saudi Arabia anymore, and they're running towards the open arms of Iran and Turkey. And the Saudis were shocked. You know, we've been sponsoring you guys for the last, I don't know, 40, 50 years with hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe billions of dollars, and, and suddenly, we're not good for you anymore. Huh? Um, this is this is the situation right now. We we see that uh, the truth springs out of the earth. Let me tell you something. Uh, there is a sobering um, moment that is now uh, happening um, to some of the leaders around in the Middle East here. And um, as you know, um, I am holding a firm, firm belief. Uh, that Israel's danger is not the immediate um, tier of countries. Uh, I don't believe so. Syria is gone already, basically. Um, Jordan has peace with Israel. Egypt has peace with Israel. And as far as Lebanon, Lebanon is torn to pieces with, with its own problems. And, um, and the Hezbollah knows exactly that Israel will, will leave nothing on the ground if, if he will attack. So uh, Ezekiel, unlike Psalm 83, which I believe already took place and was fulfilled, um, I believe Ezekiel is speaking of a second tier of the countries that are not even bordering with Israel. Neither Russia nor Turkey, Iran, Sudan, or Libya has any border with Israel. And they never felt uh, the feeling of being, um, being um, um, uh, humbled by the God of Israel, um, and I, I believe that um, it will happen. Um, and so, Psalm 83, which speaks of the very immediate surrounding Arab countries around us, um, Psalm 83, you know, before Israel was born, and just as we declared statehood, they wanted that the name of Israel will be remembered no more. Remember that 
It was all about the name of Israel. Israel just changed its name back to its original one from Palestine to Israel, and now the world wanted to destroy us. And that's, that's Psalm 83. And, and, and those countries are no longer fighting us, uh, you understand. And, and right now, if, the, if, if, if there's anything, most of the Arab, Sunni Arab world is accepting Israel as a fact. They're no longer denying it. Israel is, is something that we need to work with and, and not work against. If anything, Iran is the problem right now. So I believe that it's not about Psalm 83. I believe that Ezekiel 38 and 39 is the second tier. I believe that is what we're about to see in the very near future. And I believe that um, over the last weekend, we've seen the entrance of Gog, the prince of Magog, into the into his uh, turf, I would say, into his uh, official position. Um, and I am super, super excited. Let me, let me explain something. I just delivered a message yesterday in Zurich, in uh, St. Gallen, and the message was, seek the things which are above, Colossians 3, verses 1 and 2. And, and, and the Bible says, if then you have been raised up from the dead, with Jesus, then seek the things which are above, where Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. Seek the things which are above and not the things here on earth. I believe that what God wants for us, the believers, A, is to make sure, and, and, and Colossians 2 explains that we were dead in our trespasses, and through Christ's redemption, redemptive power, we have been risen from the dead while we're still alive. So if we are born again, if we are spirit-filled, if we are being forgiven, then what we need to do is seek those things which are above. And I explained throughout the message what is to seek the things which are above. Jesus is there. The Bible says seek, seek the things which are above where Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. So if He's at the right hand of the Father and we are here, the thing that we need to seek look for is to go and be with him these are the things we need to think about and and hope for and talk about and pray about and look forward to you know as, as paul says you know that crown of righteousness is not only for him but all those who love his appearing the, the, the appearing of jesus so so we you know to look and to seek the things which are above is to stop worrying about the things that are around us, but to just think and meditate on that which is above. To go and be with Him. But the condition is, if indeed you have been raised from the dead with Christ, in other words, if you have been forgiven, if you are believers, if you are born again, if you are spirit-filled, then seek those things which are above. And there is nothing wrong with, with being excited about those things. You know, more and more people, that even great believers that used to hold on to that belief that the rapture is an, an amazing thing that is about to happen, they lose faith in it. They, they, they gave probably time and they said it never happened, it's not, it's not going to happen. Ladies and gentlemen, if there is one thing that is the blessed hope of the believer, is indeed the rapture. And, and it's not based on fantasy. It's not based on, on some assumption. Jesus himself in John 14 says, Now I'm about to go and prepare a place for you. For if it wasn't so, I would have told you. But then I will come back. And then he himself said, I will come back to receive you unto myself. So where I am, you will also be. And if we know that Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father, and we are on this earth, where He is, we will also be. That means we are about to change our address, not Him. He didn't say, so where you are, I will come. He says, where I am, you will be. So how can we not see that? And then, of course, you know, the famous passage from 1 Thessalonians, that He will descend. The Lord Himself will descend. After He already ascended, He will descend at the last trumpet. And, of course, the dead in Christ will rise first, and we that are alive will, will join them and will meet Him in the cloud, in the air. Amazing.
How can we not be excited about those things? And how can we not seek those things? Seek the things which are above. Seek the things not only, not only to go to be with him. That will, that will happen so fast. But also what's going to happen when we get there? The Bible tells us that we're going to stand before the Lord and we're going to have to explain everything we did. And it's not going to be um, hell or heaven. We're already in heaven. It's going to be rewards or no rewards. The Bible talks about if the things that we did will remain standing after they've been tested, we will get a reward. If they will not, then we, we will suffer loss. Which, and the loss means you would not get a reward for that. And, and, and my point is this. We have to think about those things. And of course, how about that? He's about to return and reign here, and we will return with him. And how about that? He's about to make all things new after a thousand years millennial kingdom. And how about that? We will be with him also, even there. So these are the things that the Bible tells us to seek and, and think of and meditate on. And until then, we have to be watchmen on the walls. We have to spread the word of God. We have to tell the world, to tell Jerusalem, to tell New York, to tell Paris, to tell Zurich, to tell Perth and Sydney, to tell um, Los Angeles, to tell the whole world. There is hope. It's not too late now. And, and give them the gospel. That which saved your life can save theirs. Now, you give them the pill, whether they take it or not, it's their problem. But whether you gave it or not, it's your problem. That's what Watchman is all about. Watchman is all about warning the people. Now, if they died because they were not ready, that's their problem. But if they died because you never warned them, their blood is on your hand. So my, my point is not to live under the threat, but to live in that excitement and that sense of urgency to share with the world that which we know. Things are not falling apart, but they're falling in place. Everything that the Lord said that will happen, will happen. We based it, we base it on, on everything that He said that will happen in the past, that already happened. The greatest move of God in recent modern history was the return of Israel to their land. Guys, here is Jerusalem behind me. Jerusalem is behind me. The Jewish people are back in their land against all odds. We're back. We restored a land that was dead. Just as the Bible says, He brought us back the Bible says in Ezekiel 37, which is the one before 38, I will bring them out of their graves and I will set them on their own soil, on their own land. You know, God brought us over here. And Ezekiel 38 and 39 cannot happen unless Ezekiel 37 happened first. The whole attack on Israel cannot happen if Israel is not back in the land. And God brought us back to the land after after 2,000 years. How can we not see God in action? How can we not get excited about these things? So I'm very excited and I hope you are too and I hope you also understand your um, your mandate in this world. So um, I'm going to let you all go now. Not before I will proclaim the ironic blessing upon all of you and I will also tell you I encourage you to sign up to our newsletter go to our website beholdisrael.org and add your email address there if you want some beautiful pictures from wherever I travel in Israel or outside follow me on Instagram behold Israel one word um, download our free app behold Israel and follow and like us on Facebook we've we passed the 120,000 followers on my Facebook page, and I'm, I, I'm thankful for that. Thank you very much for your trust and support on YouTube. You really want to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Behold Israel. We are 
already past the 77,000, will probably hit the 80,000 in, in a week or so. And we're excited because we see so many people uh, that trusting us as a source of information to understand what is going on. This is what it's all about. Behold Israel is look at Israel. Look at Israel. Behold Israel and see that, and understand the times and the seasons in which we live. Thank you and let's, uh, let's proclaim the ironic blessing. Yevarechecha Adonai v'yishmerecha. Ya'er Adonai panav elecha v'chuneka. Yisa Adonai panav elecha v'yasem lecha shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face towards you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance towards you and grant you and give you peace, shalom. The peace that surpasses all understanding, the peace that only the Prince of Peace can give. It's a peace that the world cannot give nor can he understand. Only God, the Prince of Peace, can give you peace. The Lord of Peace can give you peace now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless you from Jerusalem. I love you all. Keep praying for my family and myself. Um, um, I've been <clears throat> very busy lately. I'm here now to stay home for the next two weeks before I'll be heading towards um, Turkey and Greece to shoot a new series called Bible Lands Unveiled in order to teach on location from those cities on you know, Bible studies that will encourage all of you on what happened there and what God is trying to say to those people there regarding us even today. Thank you and God bless you and Shalom from Jerusalem. Bye-bye.